This is Alan Boris coming to you from my office here at Kenai Peninsula College in the Anthropology Lab. And this lecture will be on um, spiritual aspects of Denina response to uh, colonization, uh, with the main point being that uh, that response involved what uh, can be called an indigenized orthodoxy. This particular talk, or portions thereof, I recently gave in, 2000, in 2013 here at an anthropology conference, Alaska Anthropological Association conference, and I'm going to include elements of a talk given at that same conference by Aaron Leggett. Uh, we gave sort of back-to-back -back talks on shaman wars and hopefully eventually that information will be published and another version of it will come out uh, in a journal called Ethnohistory uh, sometime this summer of 2013. So we're, we're discussing colonial disruption uh, to the traditional Denina cultures of Cook Inlet and uh, a response to that. Uh, in the last lectures we talked about the physical response to deny, uh, Russian occupation in the framing the um, Battle of Kenai, battles that occurred at Kenai but also at Tyonic at uh, Iliamna in response to intolerable Russian actions. But it wasn't all Russians uh, after that initial um, difficult period, violent period, things seemed to have settled down. Partly because there were very few Russians and the Russians that were here were traders and traders who provided needed goods to the Denina, at least desired goods, and uh, in return for furs and other things. But initially, the Russian occupation created power imbalances that the Denina contextualized as shaman wars. In the American occupation that followed after um, the purchase in 1867 of Alaska, uh, in 1882, the salmon canneries began to be developed in Cook Inlet, bringing people, bringing uh, new ideas bringing uh, change to Cook Inlet. And as part of that uh, change came uh, epidemics, sadly. Uh, during the Russian era, the horrific smallpox epidemic. During the American time period, an equally horrific uh, influenza epidemic, the 1918 Spanish flu. But other epidemics, measles, mumps, uh, any communicable disease the Denina were highly susceptible to. And so the period uh, just before and after 1900 was a very difficult time. Um, and how to, how to deal with that? And the shaman wars uh, were not literal wars. Uh, they were wars of ideology, really. How do, we, how do we deal with the change that's occurring? Is the question they were asking themselves. In no case did they blame the Russians or did they blame the Americans for problems that were occurring. That's an interesting sort of psychological insight. The blame was not by finger pointing and by considering themselves to be victims. That uh, wasn't the Denina way, and uh, and instead, the the use of spiritually spiritual concepts helped them deal with the change. So the first one uh, is the first Chaman War, uh, and this is described by Nick for Alexan. Uh, in a moment, I'll show you his picture. Um, and this would have occurred around 1800. Uh, the, the Denina dates aren't specific. Uh, they, don't, they don't talk about history in terms of 
specific dates, but we could place it around 1800, about the time the same battles of Kenai were taking place, and maybe afterwards. But here the Russians are only tangentially involved as the source of trade. So here's Kenai right here, and that's where the trading post was, the prime trading post of that time period. And the key areas involved were the Tionic area uh, here. We'll draw Tionic area up to the Susitna, something like that. You can push it up further, but the general area. And the Kinnick area, this is Kinnick arm, so we'll draw this as being in this area here. Tionic area and Kinnick area. The Tionic Geshka and the Kinnick Geshka were partners. Recall we talked about that relationship where that was a very important relationship, a partner relationship, because they could divert resources <coughs> excuse me, from one area to the other should uh, something happen to food storage in the villages of Kinnick, for example, the Tionic shaman could divert resources there and vice versa uh, could happen should the need be. So it was a lifelong relationship. It was an important relationship. It was uh, a way to deal with resources and the shunting of resources and maximize survival. The presence of the Russian fort in Kenai provided uh, or uh, caused an upset that um, balance that occurred in the upper inlet area. The Tionic um, Geshka had more ready access to the trade goods available in Kenai and ready access to the two passes that connect Upper Cook Inlet to the hinterland here. And that is Lake Clark Pass right here. And Merrill Pass right here. The only place, really, you can get through easily in the upper inlet area. So, the Tionic Geshka initiated trade as a middleman, uh, trade going this way, and furs coming this way, and then that Tionic Geshka would take those furs to Kenai for more trade goods going back, some of which would um, he would distribute in the same way to his people, but also into the hinterland and back again. Uh, becoming very wealthy, becoming very rich. Uh, as James Fall has written, the, the fur trade accentuated the power of the Geshka and upset the balance with the between the Tionic Geshka and his partner, the Kinnick Geshka. The Kinnick Geshka kills the Tionic Geshka. And that sets off uh, a turmoil, primarily involving two brothers, <clears throat> but also involving shaman, shaman from Kenai, who are enacting, using their powers in the stories to cause change and we don't know how long that turmoil existed, but it appears to be years. Again, it's not meant to be literal. It's more meant to be a figurative um, expression of uh, dealing with the turmoil and doesn't really come to a, to a close finality. <coughs> the... Um, 
the problems may have been exa exacerbated by the 1838-1839 smallpox epidemic. So here's a graph. You've seen a version of this earlier. This is data for the Kenai area, the Kenai River, probably Kasilov area. So here's Denina. The actual data picks up here, 1820 or so. And this is that smallpox epidemic. In um, a very short time, almost half the population dies. A terrible event. Uh, imagine how it would impact any set of communities, but um, it, uh, it, it, of course, impacted the Denina. The uh, smallpox uh, vaccination had been developed in 1796, said to be Edward Jenner was the first to develop it. Um, there's some dispute about that, that maybe others had figured it out. At any rate, uh, the uh, initial attempts to vaccinate, vaccinate the people uh, were undertaken by the Russian America Company, and then very, within a couple years were taken then over by the Orthodox Church. So, uh, and it's then within uh, that time period that orthodoxy makes significant um, inroads, shall we say, into Denina culture. So here are some of the events of orthodoxy. Uh, in 1794, uh, Father Juvenali uh, is said to have come to the Kenai Peninsula and baptized all the Kenai Denina. Uh, Certainly, by 1874, the Denina did not know, uh, extensively didn't know Russian, and he for sure didn't know um, Denina. But uh, the act of baptism took place, uh, whether or not they were cognitively aware of what this person was doing or not. Uh, Father Juvenal, Juvenali later crossed over to the other side of Cook Inlet and went through Denina territory and eventually he was when moved into Yupik territory where he was killed by Yupiks. In 1841 after the uh, smallpox epidemic the Russian Orthodox Chapel was built at Kenai and in 1844 the full church was built with Father Nicholas the first priest and in that time period, other chapels and churches were built. The, the difference between a chapel, an Orthodox chapel, and a church is the church has uh, three stages, sort of the entry area, the church uh, where the people stand, and then the altar, uh, which is back behind a screen. And only the priest and the lay reader uh, can go into the altar, but the doors are open at certain times during the service and people can look in. So a chapel does not have that altar area. So chapels or churches were then built at Kinnick, Eklutna, Tionic, Kustatan, Old Iliamna, Ninulchik, probably others. I, I, um, I need to do a more extensive research and get exactly the dates of when these were were built. Here's Father Bortnovsky, an early picture, the, the earliest picture I know of, of a priest in Kenai. Uh, all of the early priests were from Russia, naturally. Uh, later priests uh, were uh, ordained Denina or Yupik, and a few from Russia. This picture in the upper right is Our Lady of Kazan, which is an icon. Icons are, are um, standardized paintings uh, by by specific icon painters. They're not meant to be art. They're not meant to be imaginative. They're not meant to be creative. You build, you, you paint them in a certain style. And in Denina, or pardon me, in Orthodoxy, um, icon veneration is the act of looking at the icon, looking through the icon, looking into a deeper spiritual space. This particular one is in the church in Kenai. Uh, it uh, has the date 1791 written on the back in pencil. I don't know uh, if it, uh, if it, if that is when it was brought, 
uh, to Alaska, but could have been brought, brought by Father Juvenali. We don't know. And it has placed on it uh, this sort of crown of trade beads. So uh, kind of hold that image in your mind because here's, uh, this can be thought of as an image of indigenized orthodoxy. Orthodoxy, but with the stamp, so to speak, with, uh, with uh, the interpretation of traditional Danaina or Yupik culture. So uh, let's look at the the ideological or cosmological um, uh, impact, let's say, of orthodoxy. Dissonance and consonance. So dissonance. What would be what would be different? Um, so for the denina, everything happens for a reason, and causation can be through actions, words, or even thoughts. And as we talked about in the lecture on traditional Denina spirituality, um, they believed in a kind of reincarnation. Uh, Russian cosmology then, as it would be brought to, I'm going to just click through all these, got a little too fancy. As it would be, uh, as the Denina would have encountered it, would have encountered the concept of Russian fatalism. Now, just uh, this is a this is a difficult one to um, to describe in uh, sort of factual terms, uh, but Russian fatalism would be expressed through literature, through poetry, through music. The idea that control is beyond an individual, uh, the Tsar is far away, God's up in heaven. You're you're sort of uh, you're in it's a big world it's a big land and uh, what will happen will happen which is in direct contrast to everything happens for a reason um, in Russian cosmology the cause is of things is God's will uh, even a even a not, not a strong believer like Peter the Great would write if it be God's will we will defeat the Swedish army at the Battle of Poltava, which they of course did. And instead of reincarnation, the Russian uh, Orthodox cosmology of a heaven and, and or a hell existing uh, would have been, uh, would have, uh, reincarnation is not part of Russian Orthodox cosmology. That's dissonance. That would have been, uh, okay, this doesn't work for us. Uh, or we have to accommodate that in some way. Consonants then, uh, the Danina concept of Nakultani, God, uh, is would have been, uh, if not the same, similar. A presence, an essence, a power that exists. Uh, the idea of Danina spirits, we talked about spirits like um, Gujun, we talked about other spirits, even animals having spirits, having a soul. And not unlike the Russian Orthodox concept of saints, saints having a, a certain sort of power uh, associated with certain events or certain types of things. And another consonance would be the idea of having uh, a spiritual space that you move into. We talked about the idea of taking three sips of water, doing it very specifically, and that moved into a spiritually moved one into a spiritually powerful state. As I just talked about, icon veneration is a similar idea, a liminal state. Uh, icon veneration might start the Saturday evening before the Sunday service and uh, lighting a candle and being at the church and it's quiet and it's it's um, maybe incense uh, but you um, move into a more spiritual state and then uh, the Sunday morning service having uh, accentuating that liminality. So this is what people were dealing with, um, with and and uh, and I'm going to suggest to you that where there was dissonance, 
some aspects of orthodoxy were uh, adopted, uh, shall we say, but they were contextualized in terms of the consonants of Denina cosmology in the lower left. Still orthodoxy, but a very distinctive northern orthodoxy. The shaman wars are described by a number of people. Here's Nikifer Laksan of Tyonic, and uh, he has written a whole series of papers, The History of Tyonic. Uh, they're in Tyonic, and uh, there's copies on reserve in, uh, not reserve, pardon me, in the uh, restricted area of the UAA library. Uh, second Denina Shaman War uh, is also written about by Nikifer Alexan. This is one that happened in the, 19, in the 1900s, early 1900s, for uh, several decades. It's also written about by Maxime Chikaluzian Sr., uh, pictured here with his kids. And uh, that version was taken by Peter Kalifornsky and uh, he added to it and wrote a second part of it called The Other Half of the Custitan Bear Story, which uh, is the um, is a title of a piece in his book, The Custitan Bear Story and The Other Half of the Custitan Bear Story, which you have and I would urge you to read. Andrew Baluda has told a version of the Custitan Bear Story. Uh, that Shaman War, and Shempeet has a recorded version of the Custitan Bear story. Uh, neither of those, however, have been uh, translated. So I'm going to talk about the Custitan Bear story because I've had close uh, association with that story. So now we are moving into the American time period. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, the problem of dealing with epidemics. So the events of the Custitan Bear story take place in uh, in the Tyonic area. Tyonic is actually further north, but uh, in Old Custitan, New Custitan, and uh, Tyonic is just off of here. Whereas the new, uh, or the second half of the Custitan Bear story take place here at Kalifornsky Village. So I will, I'll tell the story, uh, the brief version, uh, but again, I would urge you to read it in Peter's book. That's the most accessible one to you. Uh, and we'll use this map as a prop, so to speak, to talk about the events of the Custitan Bear Story short version. So two men uh, from Custitan, uh, old Custitan, and their wives were trapping in the Bachatna Creek area. Uh, Nutenka is the place name, so this is Bachatna Creek, flows down this way, and they're trapping, and they go up into Lake Clark Pass. We don't know exactly where, but somewhere in this Lake Clark Pass area, where it eventually becomes Kijik territory. Kijik is over here on Lake Clark. This is Lake Clark right here, uh, where there is a cache, a winter cache of food, and other things, traps perhaps, of the Kijik people. The Custitan men steal the food and some of the other materials and go back to the Bachatna, to Nutenka. So this uh, this isn't just a, a theft. This uh, this for this is this is a serious thing because uh, trappers out in the in the winter would count on having that food cache be there and the alternative to it not being there is to starve so this is a serious thing uh, it's the uh, proximal cause of the bear story but it's uh, its meaning really signifies tension between two groups between the people of Cook Inlet and the people of the interior uh, Kijik area in this particular case. Uh, the Kijik people find out about the stolen uh, food, the act of thievery, and uh, two shaman, man and wife, cause their spirit to invade a bear. 
and the bear tracks down to Nutenka and kills the two men. The, their wives get back to Custatan uh, and tell the story and meanwhile the bear uh, is following this path circling around and coming in on Custatan Ridge into Custatan. The, um, the, I'm going to show you a couple other pictures here. This is Lake Clark Pass, a side valley. When you fly into Lake Clark Pass, it's, you know, the plane's in the front and you don't want to ask the pilot to, can you turn sideways you know, so I can get a good picture because this is dangerous, uh, dangerous area. So that's a side valley. And the bear is then coming this way down here toward Custatan. The um, the people uh, uh, shoot the bear. This is this is early late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, but they uh, they can't kill it. It won't die. Um, finally, a powerful man, Theodore Chickalusian, uh, goes to the chapel at Custatan and he takes three forty-five seventy bullets. Uh, now, uh, they've been shooting it with these huge forty-five seventy bullets and um, they can't kill it. So that's a big gun. That's a big rifle. Big, a lot of powder in these. It's a shaman bear. And he blesses, he baptizes the bullets, and he carves an orthodox cross in the lead. That night, this is going on for some time, that night the bear comes back. It gets into a house where there's a widow and her children and they hide in the smaller back room and barricade themselves in it and uh, the next morning the people go in and Theodore shoots the bear with the first baptized bullet and that stops it. Shoots it with the second baptized bullet and that kills it. Ah, oh, pardon me, that drops it. And then shoots it with the third baptized bullet and that kills it three bullets, baptized with an orthodox cross. Respect the symbolism. And the people uh, uh, treat the bear with uh, great respect and fear, uh, the carcass of the bear, and eventually send the spirit uh, through a, a female shaman. The shaman detects the essence of the two shaman from Kijik who had invaded the bear. And through shaman work, it's called, through various shaman activities, send the spirit of the bear back toward Kijik where the people become sick and many die. Probably influenza. The second half of the Custatan bear story takes place at Kalifornsky Village. So here at low tide is Kalifornsky Village, which is up on this bluff right here. Uh, and back further from that, uh, it's uh, just north of the Kasilov River uh, by a little creek, Unhonish Ditnu, which is this creek right here, Unhonish Ditnu. Uh, and that would have been the name of the village. Uh, Kalifornsky Village was established by Peter Kalifornsky's great-great-grandfather after he came back from Fort Ross and reestablished this village to resolve a dispute in Kenai. And at this village, Peter was born, his sister Mary Nissen, uh, and it was finally abandoned in the 1920s. Uh, so here's a here's a map of this village. Uh, I hope to 
get you a um, virtual tour of the village that was filmed uh, by um, uh, by a videographer and hopefully I'll be able to post that for you so here's a trail into the village the dark ones are prehistoric houses and the lighter ones are historic houses this is a rapidly eroding bluff here uh, this is the cemetery in this area right here Peter's grave is now right here and this is the chapel here um, this uh, this then being the uh, this is the house I'll show you in a little bit where we excavated that much right there and uh, this house was excavated in 1974 or 5 by myself and Kenai Peninsula College students. Uh, it's rapidly eroding so the house I showed you is this one. So the bluff now is about right here based on this uh, this diagram. When this diagram was made, the bluff was here. So it's eroded that far. And when it was occupied, of course, the bluff was down here. This is uh, Nick Norka's house, and this is Alec Kalifornsky, Nick Kalifornsky. Uh, this is uh, grandfather, father to Peter Kalifornsky. Maxime Chikaluzian lived here for a while, and later Nick Norka. So these are important names in the history of, of uh, Cook Inlet. Uh, here's the chapel and a marker for the chapel. And uh, here's the cemetery. So let me, let me, let me go to this one. So this is Alexei Kalifornsky. So it was Alexei who was involved in this version. Uh, so the the evil shaman from Kijik, but it's not the people that are evil, it's the sickness that's evil. It's the it's communicable diseases that are evil that the shaman can't deal with. The evil shaman invade a moose at Kalifornsky village that like the bear at Custatan harasses the people. They shoot it with their big 4570, 4590 rifles. Can't kill it. Finally, Alexei Kalifornsky goes to the chapel. I just showed you the chapel, where it was. And like, uh, like Chikaluzian, Mr. Chikaluzian, he um, blesses, baptizes three bullets. He carves an Orthodox cross in them. And he goes out looking behind the cemetery for the moose. He doesn't see it, so he's coming back and he sees it laying down back behind the cemetery. He shoots it with uh, his regular 4570 and it doesn't phase it. Um, so he shoots it with the blessed bullet and that stops it. He shoots it with the second blessed bullet, blessed bullet and that drops it. And the men from the village nearby come out, they hear the shooting, and they cut off the moose's head and lay it aside. And they see that the eyes of the moose are still following Alexei Kalifornsky around. So Alexei shoots it with the third bullet, and that kills it. They butcher the moose. Um, they uh, and they bury it uh, in the ground behind the cemetery, 
in a pit. The uh, later, the um, Alexei Kalifornsky is in his house. I don't know if it's this house or not, but in his house, and he's in his bedroom. It's at night. He's sleeping. He was said to have always slept on the floor. Even though he had a bed, he slept on the floor because, I don't know why, because he wanted to stay tough, I'm sure. And that night, a bear paw comes out under the under the bed toward him, a detached hand. And he grabs his Bible and his holy water. And he spreads holy water, sprinkles holy water on that bear paw, which then retracts back. A detached hand. Eventually the power of that moose is sent back to Kijik. And again, uh, Kijik uh, people die from the from the influenza or other communicable diseases. Eventually, Kijik is abandoned, and the people reestablish themselves at Nundalton. In 1974, um, I was a young anthropologist here at this college. And the previous uh, summer, I had excavated with Bill Workman a site uh, off of Sachansky Road. Uh, I told you about it earlier. We found one artifact in two weeks of digging with a pretty big crew of about 20 people. And at the time, we didn't really know why that was. Now we know it has to do with the concept of bagish. Um, but then we didn't really know that, so I thought I would excavate at Kalifornsky Village. Um, so Peter and I had gone out there. Uh, Jim Carrey had suggested it to me, although he was not on any of those trips. He was working with Peter on the language at the time. So Peter and I would go out to the village, and I explained to him what we would be, what we would do. And uh, he said, yeah, okay, but we have to talk with Mary. And Mary was his sister, Mary Nissen. And she lived in Kenai at the time and had a little white house right in the center of Kenai. So I went to see Mary with Peter. So the three of us sat and had tea. And Mary Nissen put me through a grilling that was unlike anything I ever received in a PhD dissertation defense or anything else that matter for that matter uh, asking me what are you going to do and why are you going to do it that way and then half hour later uh, so what are you going to do <laughs> sort of restating uh, just to be sure and finally she and she said okay okay you can ex excavate the prehistoric part but not the historic part Um, so I did, and Peter would come out and visit occasionally, and we again worked for, I'm not sure how long it was that time, a month, but uh, uh, same story, only a few handfuls of artifacts. And toward the end of that excavation, a young woman was done um, before the rest and really didn't want to start her on another square, and a nearby pit uh, that I thought was prehistoric, I had her excavate it, and in that pit we found two bear skeletons and a cut moose bone. Fast forward to when we're finishing up Peter's book, and in what probably was one of the last times Peter and I went together to Kalifornsky Village, sometime in 1991, uh, we had just finished that story, and I, he said, I'll, I'll sh when we go, I'll show you where the shaman grave is. And so we're walking in, we're taking a class of students in, and we're walking along the trail, and Peter points to a pit, and he looks to me, and he says, shaman grave. 
and a chill went down my spine because that was the very pit that I had excavated back in 1974. Thinking it was just a storage pit, and it probably initially was a storage pit, it was quite a ways from the historic part of the village, um, but it was in fact the pit where they had buried the bear. I went back to the lab, anthropology lab, to find the bones, and I couldn't find them. Couldn't find them. Um, Peter, shortly thereafter, got sick, uh, eventually died in uh, 1993, and I never did tell him that I had excavated that. I didn't know how to tell him. Years later, I was rearranging some things here at the lab, and I opened a box that was labeled rocks. And there was the remains of the bear and this bone, this one moose bone, cut moose bone, butchered moose bone. There it was. So I went to the tribe and told, their, told the story to the tribe, and they spent quite a while uh, deliberating over what should be done. Um, talked to a number of people about it. Um, yeah, I guess I would say I never would have excavated that had I known, but I didn't know. But maybe there was a reason to do that, and that was so I could tell you this story. So, in 2002, a couple of years after, uh, the tribe uh, authorized an excavation at the historic part of Kalifornski Village. And here is that excavation. It was the last remaining house at the village. Um, and it was the house of Simeon and Annie Unishev, uh, who uh, Simeon was a lay reader in the Orthodox Church, probably conducted ceremonies at the um, um, at the chapel there at, at Kalifornski Village, and Annie was a shaman, maybe the last Kenai shaman, uh, and they were husband and wife, and they lived in this house. And uh, that, to me, is indicative of indigenized orthodoxy. Uh, they uh, are the personification of uh, the nine of views of nature, of spirituality, merging with the concepts of orthodoxy as it is in its Russian form which has been called a, a, a northern religion, a religion that uh, embraces northern concepts. So uh, we excavated with about 13 youth and a few college students. Um, here's Here's the front page of the Daily News, where it uh, talks about that excavation. So, uh, about, um, I don't know, a week or two after we closed down the, villa the excavation at Kalifornski Village, I was in my office here at the college, the very place I'm sitting now, and uh, I get a call from um, the writer of this particular article, John Little, who was taking his editor around showing her places that where he had written stories for the Daily News. And he called and he said, I'm at the trail, head into Kalifornski Village, and there's a hand on the trail. I I dashed out the door. I called my wife. We live in Kasilov, not far from this. Told her, meet me at the trailhead. 
dashed out the door and drove as fast as I possibly could. Ran, I think I went through the lone red light, uh, ran in, glanced at this, still thinking it was a human hand and thinking that Peter's grave had been desecrated. Sprinted in the quarter mile or so to the village and not, nothing calm, peaceful. Uh, huh. Walked back out and cooler heads had prevailed and my wife had pointed out this is not a human hand, this is a bear paw. Ah, <sighs> relieved. But then the question is, what is a bear, bear paw doing on the trail into Kalifornsky village? And uh, looked around, there was no other, there was nothing. I carefully placed that paw under a nearby tree, went back the next morning, uh, and it was gone. So uh, this is a detached hand from Denina, traditional Denina perspective. I asked El, Denina, uh, Denina Elder Andrew Baluda, among others, uh, what it meant. And uh, he said, somebody's trying to tell you something. You did the right thing telling the story of this to the tribe, uh, and somebody's trying to tell you something. Is it good or is it bad, I asked him. And he said, well, I don't know that. I don't know which. Um, so the tribe eventually deliberated and eventually directed me to rebury the the moose bone and the bear bones in the same pit where they came from uh, in at Kalifornsky village and uh, with the tribal chairperson I went in on a cool uh, was it September yeah September October morning reburied the bones so they're back in their back in their original spot. So, indigenized orthodoxy, spiritual matters. Um, Peter Kalifornsky has written uh, of his, of Nikolai Kalifornsky, that uh, he is said to have told the people, keep on respecting the old beliefs, but there is God to be believed in that is first of all things on earth. And I take this to be uh, an instance of orthodoxy, but put and filtered through indigenized, in this specific case, Denina terms. Uh, and so it became a religion that was a way to help to understand and contextualize contextualize the dramatic changes that were happening in the early, particularly in the early 1900s, especially the diseases, the uh, influenza and other epidemics that traditional Denina shamanism could not deal with. And, uh, and uh, in fact, any medicine could not have dealt with very well at that time. Whole villages dying. There are heartbreaking uh, commentaries by uh, American uh, scientists. A lot of scientists were sent to survey the soil, survey the forest, survey the whatever, and they see whole villages sick, weak, can barely move. Keep on respecting the old beliefs, but there is God to be believed in, first of all things on earth. Here's a remarkable photo of uh, a burial with an orthodox cross and a shaman, this man here, a shaman and perhaps his helper. No priest here. The priest at that time would have been, uh, would have been a Russian, but uh, here they're combining the shamanic activities with an orthodox burial. And this is apparently somewhere in the upper inlet, um, in Den probably in Denina territory. And I thank Aaron Leggett for providing me with that, with that image. 
This too is from the upper inlet. These are the grave houses uh, at uh, Klutna, uh, which you can still see today. This is an early photo of them. Um, they are uh, a combination of the spirit, remember the ancestor spirit of the Denina, which now has a place to come and stay at an Orthodox cemetery. So they're very unique to Alaska, very unique to here, in that they combine traditional views with Orthodoxy. And uh, this is a ceremony. Uh, this is the great blessing of the water. This is not Denina. This is in Yupik territory. I took this picture two winters ago. Um, and uh, the ceremony is its a universal Orthodox ceremony, at least in Russia and Alaska. And it's done on a, at a ceremony called Theophany, which is in the uh, second or third, third week in January. Um, where they recognize the biblical event of uh, the baptism of Jesus. So they have a uh, evening service, which I went to. And this is this one is in Nustoyahuk on the Nushigak River, but this ceremony was at least in Kenai was practiced uh, up until the nineteen nineteen uh, sixties. It's still practiced out on the Nushigak, uh, the evening ceremony, and moving into that liminal state. And the next morning, the people go out onto the ice where an Orthodox cross is carved into the ice and uh, this hole, and they conduct a baptism. So, recognizing the baptism of Jesus, but with the resurrection in Orthodox terms, Jesus is now God no sin. So the purpose of baptism is to remove sin, original sin, but nothing to remove. So they shift the ceremony to what the people believe to be God's most important creation, water. Water, clean water. So they baptize the water, removing sin in the form of human-caused pollution from the water. The water is now pure. The water now has um, curative powers, and the, after this ceremony, the people would go out, um, you know, snow machines out on four wheelers or walking out onto the ice with jugs, filling them with water, believed to have curative powers, uh, because it is pure and now sanctified by God, and ready for the salmon to return. So this is conducted by an Orthodox priest, but who himself is, uh, in this case, Yupik, a native priest. So here he is. Uh, all the major events in that village are um, sort of um, blessed by the priest. Indigenized Orthodoxy, uh, pure water for salmon, for the people uh, to um, to sustain their life in these sustainable economies, sustainable cultures. So, indigenized orthodoxy, uh, shaman wars meant to deal with the pressures of change uh, in, a, in an emotional and spiritual basis. So thank you for listening. Uh, many of these ideas are not meant to are meant to um, help you and I understand the cultures of the area. Uh, I guess I would just urge you uh, not to uh, commit the anthropological sin of ethnocentrism to condemn any of these ideas. Uh, the people shared them reluctantly because they are easily condemned by people who don't have the background to understand question is not what's right or wrong uh, from our anthropological point of view. That's certainly a question you can ask, but from an anthropological point of view, how can we better understand the place? How can we better understand the cultures? How can we better understand sustainability 
by, in this case, understanding uh, what might be called the spirituality of sustainability. So thank you. Thank you very much for listening.